right, good evening. Welcome to First Baptist Church this evening. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have an excellent service in store. As you can see, uh, we will be uh, observing the Lord's Supper this evening uh, near the end. Uh, but uh, for starters, we're going to sing, My God's a Great God. Will you stand and sing with me as we begin our service? My God's a Great God. My God's a great God and worthy to be praised. My God's a great God, oh, praise his holy name. He made the world so great, he keeps me by his face, and soon I'll see his face. My God's so great. Great God and worthy to be praised. My God's a great God. Oh, praise his holy name. He made the world so great. He keeps me by his grace. And soon I'll see his face. Just in time. You know, uh, this morning, uh, Jim was running around all over the place uh, handling, going back to using our old backup board and, and getting all the audio settings. And of course, tonight, you know, everything sounds great, but then the, the computer decides to be ornery and just, oh, I'm not going to start the service when you start the service. So, uh, you know, but that's sometimes the way it goes, but that's all right. Do we have, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving? Colby, do we have the, the next one? I will enter his gates. It's good now? Ah, there we go. And as usual, Jim is on the case and fixing it as we sing. So here we go. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. Oh, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Are you next? Are you coming up now? Are you, you got the, all right, bail me out. Come on up here. All right, you may be seated. Glad that you're here tonight. Had a good service this morning. And uh, if we want to, first of all, recognize any folks that may be visiting with us tonight, First Baptist Church of Ruskin, if this is your first time, if we've got some ushers, are they coming? No ushers. Well, I guess if you're visiting, you're out of luck tonight. I don't know, but uh, I hope that you got a bulletin. Do we have some folks visiting with us? Anyone for the first time? First time in a long time. All right, we got some folks right here. And uh, if not, uh, if we don't have anybody coming, Raj, we got a uh, visitor's card there. If not, I'll tell you what. Just after the service, I'll be right out the back, double doors there at the Welcome Center. Uh, we have a visitor's card just for you to fill out so we all have a record of your visit. And uh, they'd just like to give you a little thank you gift for being here uh, with us uh, tonight. Raj, right up here on my left to your right, okay? And uh, they'll fill that out. Alrighty. Well, we want to uh, go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment, but we're going to try to combine a little bit of saving time. Uh, we're going to have the, observe the Lord's Supper tonight. Remember now, next week is going to be Labor Day, and we'll have our regular Sunday school and uh, morning service at 1030, uh, but no service next Sunday night. So make sure that you uh, mark that down. I want to thank those of you that prayed for Mickey and I while we were gone this past week. Had a good time, uh, but it's always good to get back home, and for that we are indeed thankful. We want to uh, share our missionary of the week. 
And uh, tonight is going to be the Nunez. And it's always good news when we hear from our missionaries that are winning people to Christ. That's the reason we send them. And they're doing a great job for the Lord. And it says, uh, Dear Dr. Rumsey and First Baptist Church, I wrote this prayer letter early today, then a Bible study, another meeting, and an hour plus uh, with a lady that he had been witnessing to. And he adds here, uh, Brother Nunez, it says, Please add to your uh, prayer request list Mrs. Fatima Oliveira. Uh, she got saved tonight as I witnessed to her. She lives in Switzerland. Mrs. Fatima will have a major surgery next week, uh, Lord willing. And uh, thank, thank you for being there. Thank you for your prayers, your financial support. We need it more than ever and uh, you're going to find out in the letters ahead uh, why we depend upon you so much, uh, the Nunez family. But we always rejoice and are glad to hear folks that are getting saved, amen, and uh, who trust the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. So let's remember them as they serve the Lord, and uh, we're going to have a word of prayer. And after that, uh, we're going to have a special by Janice and then the choir. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this evening. We thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we thank you for this good report from the Nunezes. Uh, they're doing a great job. And we thank you for uh, Mrs. Fatima who got saved. And Lord, we pray for the surgery that she's having. Uh, God, we just ask that you would uh, help her and be with her uh, during this difficult time. But we rejoice in her salvation. So Lord, we just pray now for the Nunezes. Bless their work. We're so thankful that we here at First Baptist have a part uh, in their ministry through prayer and financial giving to support them on the field. And Lord, we just commit this service to you tonight. Be with Janice as she sings and the choir to follow. And pray for uh, pastors. He brings a message. And we'll be careful to give you and you alone all the honor and the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. Okay, I guess we're fine. I was a sinner, a covered with shame, lost and defiled with no merit to claim. In spite of my sin, saved me, redeemed me, and cleansed me within. God did a wonderful thing for me, that glorious happy day. God did a wonderful me when he took all my sin away. Could I forget it, that wonderful time when I was saved was a moment sublime. All through life's journey, I'll sing of his love. Someday I'll tell it to angels above. God did a wonderful thing for me that glorious happy day. God did a wonderful thing for me when he took my sin away. God did a wonderful thing for me that glorious happy day. God did a wonderful thing for me when 
All right. Thank you so much, choir. Praise is rising. We've got a little more praise to sing to our God, uh, but in a few minutes, right now, we want to just have a time of fellowship. We want to give the choir a chance to come on down and find their spot in the congregation. You guys can stand, greet each other, handshakes, waves, hugs, whatever works for you. Instruments are going to play, and we'll sing some more in a minute. Go ahead and have that fellowship time. Thank you for uh, thank you for enjoying that time of fellowship. The song that you were hearing is called "Mighty Is Our God." We're going to keep singing together this evening. "Mighty Is Our God." Mighty is our God. Mighty is our King. Mighty is our Lord, ruler of every. To our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater, for he has created everything. Mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything. Now, this, uh, this last one is called, O Come Let Us Adore Him. I, uh, I announced that uh, we're proceeding with our Christmas cantata plans in a couple of weeks. You can see me about that if you have any questions. Uh, this takes just like the last half of a famous Christmas carol and uh, just tweaks the words a little bit and it just becomes a praise and worship song for our Lord. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore For he alone is 
This afternoon we watched a little bit of the dignified memorial for our fallen soldiers. I'm going to pray for that family. Tried to do some other things around the house and it was one of the afternoons where everything that could go wrong went wrong. Matter of fact, I said, if one more thing goes wrong, it will be a perfect afternoon. And within about two minutes, I broke my phone. It was a perfect afternoon for everything going wrong. Actually, the phone didn't break, but the cover that protects the phone, it just disintegrated. I just want you to know that my wife was present for all of this. I didn't blame her. I was tempted, but I didn't blame her. I knew it was her fault, though, because just having her near, where is she? There she is. By the way, my wife is getting the habit of sitting right between a pole and me. This happened last week, too, and now she's back to mind a pole again. When I speak to her tonight, whenever it's her turn, I'm going to, so you'll know I'm looking at her. Jim, are you singing the night? Because it says Robert O. So. Okay. Robert's going to lose his hair. It's going to be painful. <laughs> Heavenly Father. We do pray for these families who have lost their young men, young women, soldiers and sailors, Marines. We pray for their families. We can only imagine what they're going through. We thank you for the willingness to sacrifice their lives. We pray for our president. We ask you to give him wisdom. In Christ's name, amen.
Well, this evening we're going to finish out the chapter, Romans chapter 10, in our verse-by-verse study, Romans 10, chapter, chapter 10, and verse 16. In the study of the book of Romans, we looked at three major doctrines. They're the doctrine of sin, salvation, and sanctification. The doctrine of sin is for all of sin. The doctrine of salvation is that the offer of salvation is given to everyone. And the doctrine of sanctification is that everyone is expected to live a sanctified life. If you know Christ as Savior, that's the next step. From there, we go to the problems of the gospel, and it's chapter 9, 10, and 11. In chapter 9, it's God's past dealings with Israel. In chapter 10, it's God's present dealings with Israel. We looked at verse 1 through 5. We saw how Christ was revealed. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. From Christ revealed, Paul went to Christ received. Romans chapter 10, verse 6 to verse 15. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend from the deep? That is, to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and in thy heart. That is, the word of faith which we preach. That If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the mouth, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now the words of righteousness from verse 6 through 10 tell what righteousness does not ask, and what righteousness does not say, and what righteousness does say. Those words are followed by what could be called common sense in verse 11 through 15. Now we study the consequences of rejection and some conclusions from God coming through two prophets of the Old Testament concerning the most serious sin that anyone could commit. And the most serious sin that anyone could commit is rejecting Jesus Christ. Verse 16 through 22. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, I was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Heavenly Father, help us as we study your word. Give us wisdom concerning what the word of God says and how it applies to people today. In Christ's name, amen. Found in verse 16 through verse 21 are quotes of Old Testament texts which relate back to verse 14 and 15, which was salvation's sequence of prerequisites. We looked at it this morning. How then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? In the five verses we'll study tonight, Paul deals with those who were described in the first 15 verses of this chapter. They have heard, they have received, and still they have rejected God and His Son and the Scripture's offer of salvation. That's verse 1 through 5. Verse 4 says, Christ is the end 
of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. The Scripture's instructions are given in verse 6 through 15. For instance, verse 11, 12, 13, salvation's offer is not based on race, and it's not based upon works, but it's based upon the faith of an individual. And in verse 14 and 15, salvation's order and sequence is given. Someone prepares to give the gospel to others. Someone is sent to speak the gospel. The gospel is presented and heard. The gospel is heard and believed. And the new believer confesses. They tell others with their mouth about the faith in their heart. And then tonight we come back with the scripture's information. Now before we begin the verse by verse, I want to share with you something that I saw a week or so back. And it is very sobering to me. There's a meme. And it said, the gospel is the means and method of receiving eternal life for those who believe. For all others, it's a death sentence. The gospel is what saves. Rejection of the gospel damns. In verse 16 through 20, Paul addresses the Jewish rejection of Jesus Christ, and he basically calls it unreasonable. Paul is going to rely upon two Old Testament prophets and himself to reason with the people of Israel. He begins with what Isaiah said in verse 16 and 17. Have they not obeyed the gospel? Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's a quote of Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Not only is Paul quoting the prophet, like Isaiah, he is weeping as Isaiah wept over the spiritual state of Israel, his own nation. And his own people. He is broken hearted by their unreasonable unbelief. Now the fact that Isaiah and then Paul were grieving over the same issue illustrates that this is not something new. Isaiah lived eight centuries before Paul. This rejection of God by Israel is repeated through Scripture. When Jesus came to this nation, he repeatedly said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. The reason for the cry is obvious. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The foremost need of every person is to hear what the word of God says. If we do not hear, we will not believe. And if we do not believe, there are eternal consequences which are extremely negative. The message has not changed. Faith was required when Isaiah spoke the word of the Lord. Faith was required when Paul spoke the word of the Lord. And faith is still required no matter who is speaking the word of the Lord. The problem is found in the question, who hath believed our report? Isaiah said, I preached, but who heard? Who believed? Paul says the same thing. He echoes the question. And the question implies that the people whom the message was given did not receive it. They did not accept it. They did not believe it. Israel, as a nation, has not believed. Not in Isaiah's time. Not in Paul's time. Not in ours either. So how did he, Isaiah, and he, Paul, know the message was rejected? No. The same way we know the report that the message is believed or rejected. Because the life principle is what we believe is proved by how we behave. Every now and then you hear someone say, well, Christians aren't supposed to judge. I don't know what Bible you're reading if you think that. If you want to call it discernment, call it discernment. We're to judge all the time. We're to judge people's fruit. We're to judge people's life. We're to judge our own life. Concerning the Lord's Supper, Paul said, if you'll judge yourself, you won't need to be judged by others. The issue, 28 centuries ago for Isaiah, and 20 centuries ago for Paul, and today is, what has been heard and what has been believed. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. If you do not hear the word of God, you will not believe. And if you hear but do not accept the word of God is true, there is no faith. And faith is the one and only means of salvation. So from what Isaiah said, we go to what Paul said. 
verse 18 and 19. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the end of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? They had heard in Isaiah's time. They had heard in Paul's time. Matter of fact, according to the Apostle Paul, here in several other places, the message of the gospel had already made it around the world before Paul's life ended and before the first century ended. Several years back, there was a Southern Baptist preacher who kind of became a charismatic preacher who decided to run for president. And his stated reason was, if he became president, he could spread the word of the Lord among the whole world and the Lord could come back. Well, good to spread the word of the Lord. But the question is asked earlier in this chapter, God doesn't need us to go to heaven to bring him back. Didn't he the first time? It, that, that's not our business. That's God's business. God will take care of that. Four times in the New Testament, we are told that the entire world had been evangelized in the New Testament. Romans 10, 18, right here. Acts 19, 10. Colossians 1, 5 and 6. And Colossians 1, 23. Now, if you want to play mind games, I could ask you a question. Let's have some. When Paul says, their words went into the end of the world. Roman world? Known world? Entire world? The answer? Yes. Mm -hmm. Whatever world you want to pick. The answer is yes. Since was this was recorded in the history book of the New Testament, Acts, and two of the epistles of the New Testament, we know that this great spread of the gospel and the revival which resulted from it took place before the scripture was even completed. For Paul to write this, that it's already taken place, means that the gospel had already gone throughout the world when he wrote the book of Romans. One of the last books he wrote, by the way. It's fascinating to me that even the phrases and words used in the Great Commission were used to tell of the great commitment of the believers of the first century. For instance, Colossians 1, verse 5 and 6, whereof ye have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world. Colossians 1, 23, the gospel which ye have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Why, it sounds a whole lot like Mark 16, 15. Matter of fact, it fulfills Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Romans 10, 18. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. My, it kind of sounds like it might have fulfilled Matthew 28, 19, and 20. The Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Acts chapter 8, second part of verse 1, and then verse 4. At that time, there was great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Fascinating, I find it, that the apostles were those who heard the Lord speak the Great Commission, given to us four or five times in Scripture. They heard, at, they, we know they heard the one in, in Mark. We know they heard the one in Matthew. We know they heard the one in Acts. They were told to go to the world, and the last ones to leave were the guys who heard it themselves. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Here's the last great commission the Lord gave just before he ascended into heaven. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the world. Acts 1, 8. Acts 8, 4. By the way, our culture's interpretation of Acts 1, 8 is a geographic pattern concentric circles. We have Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, 
uttermost part of the world. And when we look at the scripture, we say, well, that, that's pretty much what they did. But in the scripture, there is evidence that the Jews interpreted Acts 1-8 very differently than that. We can find evidence that the Jews interpreted as reach the Jews first. Then reach out to the Samaritans. Then go to the rest of the world. Because that's exactly what they did. Both interpretations are valid. You can look at a scripture verse and one goes geography and the one goes, no, that, that's something different than that. Acts 19.10 includes both the geography and the cultural racial distinctives. All they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. In the Jewish mind, they have a very difficult time getting away from the race issues. In Acts 24, 5, Paul was accused of being a mover of sedition among the Jews throughout all the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. But that's near the end of the book of the Acts getting near the end of the life of the Apostle Paul, and there are still folks who were hooked on the racial aspect. Even though that Paul was the, the apostle to the Gentile, he's accused of being a mover of sedition among the Jews in all the world. By the way, this accusation is testimony to the Jewish mindset and testimony of the worldwide spread of the gospel. You know the last time the entire world heard the gospel? first century the bible tells it will happen again the whole world will hear the gospel you know what's going to happen during tribulation there has not been a generation of believers from the first century until now who has accomplished what was accomplished in the first century if anything we're losing ground i don't know if you know it or not but the generation of young people who are in school right now have the highest rate of atheism that has ever been in the United States of America. Over 30% of school age people in our country claiming to be atheists. I believe the scripture talks about a great falling away. On a sad note, the plan of Acts 1-8 was not followed until compliance was forced. The church of Jerusalem grew wildly, thousands a day, another thousand here, a thousand there. But by Acts 8-1, a great persecution arose against the church at Jerusalem, and it caused the believers at Jerusalem to be scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Therefore, verse 4 says, they, were scattered, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. They had to be motivated by persecution. I don't know about you. I would rather obey the Lord out of love and out of fear. I don't want to be persecuted. I would, I would rather obey the Lord because he told me to do it because I love him. Now, there are times as a boy that um, I obeyed my parents as a result of persecution. Persecution in my family looked like a stick about that long. Yeah, stick. My dad was a carpenter, so he made a nice thick stick and he made it comfortable for himself. It had a handle on it so his hand didn't slip. That was a form of persecution. It said, you will obey or you will suffer the consequences for not obeying. As I got older, I figured out, yeah, it's better to obey than to suffer persecution because the end result was the same. You were going to do what my dad said. One way or another, you're going to do it. As you get older, you go, okay, that's just do it. How about another prophet? Verse 19, the prophet Moses. First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people. By a foolish nation 
I will anger you. It's a quote of Deuteronomy chapter 32, 21. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanity, idolatry, folks. I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. We've already looked at it earlier. This whole thing was illustrated by the life of the prophet Hosea, whom Paul quoted in chapter 9 and verse 25. God told Hosea to marry a woman named Gomer. She was a prostitute. She was unfaithful to her husband. After she was married to Hosea, she played the prostitute and began to bear the children of other men. And Hosea knew. The interpretations of the children's names were things like, not of my blood, not my son. Gomer is the illustration of Israel. And Hosea is the image of a loving and patient God who sought to bring Israel back to the position of faithfulness. The story is a physical representation, like a play or dramatic presentation of a spiritual drama. And the drama was between God, the Father, and the nation of Israel. And the problem was the nation of Israel was continually committing spiritual adultery through idolatry. And God finally said, I've had enough. I'm going to make them jealous. I'll give my attention to somebody else. Now, my wife and I just celebrated our 45th anniversary. We were married at 8 and 10. It's very obvious, isn't it? Now, I like her. She likes me, too. If she gave more attention to any man in this world than me, I'm jealous. The other is true, the other way too. She used to say, well, I'm not jealous. Well, we figured that was wrong. I'll tell you a neat little story. Years ago, I was singing at a church in Columbus, Ohio. A lady came up to me, very attractive woman. She said, my husband hates Tate backgrounds, but he loved the song that you sang tonight. He said, can you tell me the name of the song? And I said, well, I said, you like, we can just go up there in the sound booth and I'll show you and that you can order the exact song. She said, fine. So we walked back to that corner and went up the steps. And before we got to the steps, behind us, coming up the steps, was a little bitty woman whose eyes were flashing green. And she said, who is that woman? I basically said, I thought you weren't jealous. She's jealous. We established it. She didn't want me leaving the room with someone other than her. By the way, I think it's grace. <laughs> I love it. Of course I do. I want her to be jealous of my attention and affection. And vice versa. She should want mine. And Israel should have wanted God's attention too. The tactic of God was to make the chosen people who had become a people disinterested in a relationship with God and instead interested in idols and icons, the gods of other nations. God decided to make them jealous by honoring and blessing others. Have you ever been in a worship service where you're kind of just sitting there and the invitation hits and all of a sudden, without being spurred on by the pastor, who, by the way, preachers can make emotional invitations and drag people forward. I've been in worship service before where the preacher said, if you love God, get yourself down here. Well, I love God, but I'm not going to be used by you. I'm, I'm not putting up with that. I'll love God with my arms crossed in front of me if you behave that way. But there have been times I've been in a worship service, my eyes are closed, and I realize that all around me, People have left, and they're at the altar. And I have felt myself get jealous that God would speak to them. 
that not to me? Now, it may have been that they had sin neck deep in their life and they're getting themselves clean. Even then, I want God to speak to me. I want to hear from him. By the way, jealousy is often equated with envy, which is sin. But there is such a thing as a righteous jealousy, and it's what we've been describing. It's righteous for God to be jealous of the worship and honor of his people. Just like it's right for a man or a woman to be jealous of the attention of their mate. The motivation from jealousy can be used in a positive way and used for a positive outcome. Job used that same righteous jealousy using the golden rule. I don't want my wife to behave this way, so I won't behave this way. And he talked about how he's going to behave with his neighbor's wife in Job 31, verse 1 through 12. I don't want to behave in any way that would make my wife jealous because I don't want her to behave in any way That would make me jealous. It was the motivation when Moses' words were used to to motivate Israel to remain faithful spiritually to God. It's a paraphrase of what God said through Moses. Basically this, Lord, or Israel, if you want God's positive attention, his blessing, and you don't want those blessings transferred to another, then do what is right concerning your worship and devotion to him. Tell you one more story and then I'm going to finish this thing out. Vicki and I have been dating for maybe two or three months. We both in the dormitory at the school. And I'm shaving. And a fella walks up next to me and he says, uh, Do you know a girl named Vicki Vick? I said, Yeah, I've met her. We'd been dating for three or four months. And he said, You know, I. I like her. He said, I I think I'm going to ask her on a date. And I said, I think you should. Well, a a day or so, my girlfriend says, "Um, there's another fella and uh, asked me out. And I said, well, you're going to date him? Um, I said, you know, there's been some other girls here at the school, and you're the only girl I've dated at the school, and, and I might want to date another girl. She said, well, I I'm not saying I'm going to date him. She tried to play me. I'm in trouble. It's okay. I'm illustrating the Scripture real well. The honest truth was, I didn't want her dating another guy. Found out pretty quick. She didn't want me dating another girl. So the only girl I dated at the Bible college was the one I married. When you find the one you want, it's time to quit hunting. Now Paul cited Isaiah. He cited Moses. And he came back to Isaiah 20 and 21. Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that asked me not after, it asked not after me. But to Israel, he, God saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. It's a quote of Isaiah 65, 1. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. It addresses the repeated rejection of God by Israel and the conversion of the Gentiles. Paul cited both Isaiah and Moses as witness to the fact that the Hebrew people had been told for years about the conversion of the Gentiles. The Jews should accept it and believe if for no other reason than this, God has allowed the Gentiles to be converted in order to provoke them, God's people, to jealousy. Does God still love Israel? You bet he does. The Abrahamic covenant is still in force. Those who bless them, I will bless. Those who curse them, I will curse. We began this outline with stating that the Jewish rejection of Jesus Christ is unreasonable, and it is. 
with all that God has done for Israel, with all their advantages, the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the, the law, the service of God, the promises, all those things in chapter 9 and verse 4. The Jewish people, of all people, should not have rejected the Savior. And they should not continue in their rejection. But they do continue in their rejection. It's unrelenting. Verse 21. But to Israel he saith, all day long I have stretched forth my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Not only is their rejection of Jesus unrelenting, there seems to be no sign or slow. We know it will end one day after the tribulation, at the Lord's return, the second coming. The blinded eyes of the Jewish people will be open, and they will recognize Jesus Christ for who he is, their Messiah. Then, as the united nation, the people of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will finally embrace their rightful Lord and King. But until then, there is only a small remnant of Jewish people who come to Christ. There's always been a remnant. God's promise is true with that, but it's always been a small number. What should we do? Should we reach out to the Jewish people to tell them about Christ? Absolutely. They need to hear about Jesus Christ as everybody else. Because as we studied this morning, there is no racism with God. For the Jew, the Gentile, it's all the same. He wants everybody to come to him. So we go. We tell. We teach. We ask God to speak to their heart. We pray for the Jews. We pray for Jerusalem. By the way, we're, we're commanded in Scripture to pay for the, pray for the peace of Israel. Heavenly Father, how sad it is that the chosen people, those who you came to seek and save, the people who Christ called his own, have not received him. As they rejected his father years before, as they rejected the word of God, as they rejected the prophets, they rejected Jesus Christ. And then on the day of Pentecost, they rejected the Spirit of God as well. We pray for Israel that their blinded eyes would be open, that the Jewish people would accept their Messiah. We pray that the remnant would grow. We ask, Lord, that you would use increased numbers of believers of all races, creeds, and cultures to increase the honor and glory that human beings give to you because we know you deserve help us to be a part of it in Christ's name we pray amen would you stand with us Robert's going to sing one verse of an invitation song we're going to listen pray we'll join him on the second and follow me I heard my master say I gave my life to ransom thee surrender your all today wherever he leads I'll go Thank you.
follow my Christ who loves me so wherever he leads I'll go he drew me closer to his side I sought his will to So wherever he leads, I'll go. Sandy Weatherholt is scheduled to dismiss us in prayer, and he's got something in his hand. Did you remember? Oh, good, okay. Pray for us, please. (laughs) Yeah, your instrument's rather large. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, what he did for us. We thank you for your word as it was preached tonight. Lord, we pray that we would have this burden that you gave to your disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Lord, we pray that we would support, indeed, our missionaries that that are out there uh, carrying out the Great Commission. We pray that this church would do its part, that we would do our part. Lord, we pray now for the rest of this service that would honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to receive the Lord's table. If you'd like to stay for that, you're welcome to be seated. Do you have the supplies? The supplies come in one easy little packet. Anyone need? Our guys were good about getting it passed out. Good. You are familiar. These are two parts. There is a film that you pull off to get the bread and then a second film that you pull back for the juice. Luke chapter 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he, Jesus, sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? Did you recognize that as a miracle? That is a miracle? The omniscience of Jesus Christ is evident in his daily affairs. He's going to town. Follow the guy with a pot. Wherever he goes in, you'll you'll find a man that's already made ready for us. Verse 12. He shall show you a large upper room furnished there make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them. And they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him and said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until I be fulfilled, till it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this, divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. If you take and peel the Thin layer back, expose the bread. 
body of Christ symboled by this was broken for us. No bones, but his flesh for our sin. His sacrifice. Take this bread. After he blessed it, we'll just bless it first. Heavenly Father, I pray you bless the bread, the symbol of your body that was broken for us. We thank you for what you did for us on Calvary. We can tell even from this passage of Scripture that you knew exactly what was coming, and you still did it. In Christ's name, amen. Take the bread. After the bread, he followed with the cup, which is the symbol of his blood. Scripture says, after the same manner they took the bread, he prayed over the cup, and then they shared. Heavenly Father, that you would shed the blood of your Son for us. Is humbling. That the blood of God was shed on that cross. We thank you that you shed your blood to pay the price for our sin. We ask now that you bless this to us. Jesus said to them, drink ye all of it. The evening was finished with a hymn, probably a psalm. We have no idea which, but we can sing some hymns that are very appropriate. Would you stand with me? We will make the hymn be our dismissal. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains god bless you have a wonderful week see you next we'll see you wednesday and then next sunday and then the wednesday after that